start in a few minutes. I'm not going to teach this entire class by myself. I know, I know. You know, you cut them in, but it's too easy by all means. That's all we're doing here. It's going to be like that. It's humble people in the middle of it. The humble people? Yeah. <laughs> look at their own nice shoes. I don't think your knife's working. You don't think so? One, two, three, four. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I just put it down because I haven't started yet. I don't know if I'm going to use the entire time this this week. Um, I'm going to do like the first half hour, 40 minutes, and then Sue and I are going to have a conversation. Um, she has a particular passion for Mary Magdalene, and, and she's going to talk about um, some of the stuff that's going on currently with Mary Magdalene. As you, as you probably know, my interest on all this stuff, I take mainly like a historical look at stuff as to what's credible, what's not credible, all that sort of stuff. But that's only one way to look at the material. There's lots of different ways of looking at things. And today is going to be less historical than the last one. So, um, so the, the class is on forgotten, misrepresented, and marginalized things. Is going to be things. hysterical? What's that? You mean it's going to be hysterical? It will be. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the class is, so far, we start with John the Baptist, and then we did Mary Magdalene, and what does the Bible say about her, and what happens to her. I'll go over that. <coughs> and then the next one, um, we have an opening May 15th, but I'm going to be out of town, so I can't do that. But uh, June 1st, is it? First, second? The first Sunday in June, I'm going to do James, the brother of Jesus. Um, someone that most of us know very little about, but um, and it's interesting that, you know, in the, in the generation after Jesus dies, um, James becomes the leader of the church. Not Paul, not Peter, but James does. And we know very little about him. And at the end of the series, I'll tell you why I think some of these people have become, we know something about these people, but we don't know their complete picture or a fuller picture of these people. Um, and part of that, I, well, I'll give you an explanation at the end, end of this as to why I think that's happening. Um, and you might be able to put some ideas together on your own as to why some of these figures might be um, marginalized um, over the years. Um, so last week we, we talked about Mary Magdalene, um, who is incredibly popular in popular culture right now. Um, Yeah, we're not going to update the app in the middle of the search. <laughs> um, this is from Jesus Christ Superstar, just 10 people over the years. Just, the interesting thing is you just don't see any <coughs> Middle Easterners, which she would have obviously been. Uh, she, she didn't look like many of these people. Um, this is from The Last Temptation of Christ, where the last temptation that Jesus has Hey, how many have seen The Last Temptation of Christ? I read it. You read it? Did you like it? Yes. Okay. And, and I'm going to ask you guys to help me with some of this stuff along the way. Um, because we're going to get into a little bit of weird stuff this week. Um, I'm going to steer as far from it as possible, but we can't avoid it when we get into some Gnosticism. So The Last Temptation of Christ, The Last Temptation is the devil then when he's on the cross um, comes and says, this is what you could have had. If you had gotten married and had children and all of those things, and he eventually rejects that. And that's Barbara Hersey, who's um, who's Mary Magdalene, and then the Passion of the Christ. Who's seen the Passion of the Christ? Well, the Passion of the Christ is the the weirdest one because you know people are frequently because there's not much on Mary Magdalene in the Bible. They're frequently conflating Mary with other figures. So this conflates Mary with the, the woman living in adultery, which isn't even, as I told you before, in, in John uh, 7 and 8, isn't even originally in the Bible. Um, it's a late addition to the Bible. So um, Mel Gibson doesn't even know what's in the Bible or not in the Bible um, when he was putting this stuff together. He also has Jesus speaking Latin, which I don't think anyone in the world <laughs> or any historian thinks Jesus knew Latin much less probably didn't know Greek. He, he's, he, I, my guess is he spoke one language, which was Aramaic. Hmm. And we'll talk about Aramaic today. And then the Da Vinci Code, 
uh, who's, who's watched or read it? Who liked it? It's a good story. There's a lot of really, really stupid stuff in it, but um, <laughs> a good read. it's a good read. And it kept me busy for like a year going through saying, there's really lots of interesting stuff about women in the Bible, but none of it's in this book. Um, so, uh, so here is Charlotte Graham, who's only seen is, is in the in the casket, and then, and then we get to what what does the Bible tell us about uh, Mary Magdalene last week, and and um, bef before the crucifixion, what does it say? Mark, the first gospel. Remember, Mark's the first gospel written, and then what's the next gospel written? Matthew. Matthew tells us nothing about Mary Magdalene before the crucifixion. Next gospel written is Luke. Luke tells us nothing about uh, Mary Magdalene before the crucifixion. And John and Luke, um, John gives us nothing, then Luke gives us three verses total. Luke 8, 1 through, through 3. And she's not the only person um, described in this passage. Here's the entire passage. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called, the Mag called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the, the manager of Herod's household. That's Herod Antipas, the guy who puts John the Baptist, uh, executes him. So his chief of staff's wife is helping underwrite the cost of Jesus' um, ministry. Um, uh, Susanna and many others, these women were helping to support them out of their own means. Them is the 12 and the whole ministry. So these women, um, so, so what do we have? What do we learn about these people? They were, Mary is one, she's a follower of Jesus, right? Two, she's a believer in the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is a specific thing that Jesus is teaching. He's, te he's teaching that the that God is going to come down, take over, throw out the Romans, and take control of everything. And um, she's a believer in this. Um, she traveled with Jesus. She had seven demons exercised from her. We know nothing about what the demons were. It also, interestingly, doesn't tell us who exercised the demons. Uh, we can assume it's Jesus, but it doesn't really say. And then that she's a woman of means, as... Um, as we were pointing out last last time. We don't know how she had the money. Um, she supported Jesus' ministry. And then finally, she was a resident of Magdala in Jewish Galilee. So that's what we know from the Bible before the crucifixion. This is everything <coughs> that we know. And you can put this stuff together in a lot of different ways. And modern movies put it together in one way. I gave you another way to look at it. Um, just imagine if she is... Um, a widower who's older, who has money, whose husband had a uh, had a business like maybe fishing or something like that, and um, dies. She's left with the money, and the demons that she has is his is her inability to have children. Um, I mean, that would be one way to see her. To see her another way is to see her as you know a um, a prostitute and all of these other things that we have in popular culture. But that's not in there. That's stuff that you have to fill in. So, um, about Magdala, go ahead. In John's Gospel, I mean, isn't she the one at the tomb? I, this is before the crucifixion, I said. Oh, before. This is everything we know about her before the crucifixion. And she, she's at the, yeah, she's at the tomb, um, not just there. She's at the tomb in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is interesting. She sort of comes out of nowhere. So Magdala is this place right here on the Sea of Galilee. Bethlehem. I mean, Nazareth is down yeah. here. Nazareth is a town of um, like 200 people, maybe 300 people most. So that's where mm -hmm. Jesus grows up. And um, you have maybe probably half of the village is are relatives of his. So when it says the people of Nazareth reject him, it's a lot of members of his family. And in John, it says John's brothers criticize him. This was before they believed in him. So early in his life, and in Mark, Mark 3, they, um, Jesus' siblings come, and, um, and he's in Capernaum healing somebody, and they show up and say, stop doing, you know, stop this whole thing. Uh, he's lost his mind. He's crazy. 
and that's that's Jesus's brothers. So when people talk about family values, um, that's what, and it makes sense when Jesus says, "Who is my family? Is it my brothers, my literal brothers and sisters, or the people who are following me?" With literal brothers and sisters and everybody else, and his cousins, and everybody else thought he was crazy. So that's not going to be who he's leaning on. Um, so Magdal has been in the last. 15 years, this place with great excavations. Um, this is one synagogue, two synagogues have been found there, which is amazing because um, there are only, I think it's seven or eight synagogues total found uh, before the, um, the fall of Jerusalem in the year 70 AD. And two of them are, are here. This is a large one that was found 15 years ago, and then another one was found in December. And they're just now starting to excavate it. All sorts of stuff um, was built there. I've said that it's a good place to see about the democratization of religion, that everybody, in the in early in, um, in the Old Testament times, um, a lot of the religious practices were done by the priests. And during this time, the Pharisees and the Jesus people were saying, everybody should be doing this stuff, these rites of purification and so forth. So not just have we found these, but we found um, mikvah oats, which are the pools that you go in and cleanse yourself. Um, all of that sort of stuff are in people's homes, even though the, the sea is right there. You could go in the sea and, um, and purify yourself. People are doing that there and, and, and all sorts of other things. This is another thing, the famous stone of Magdala, which is apparently a three-dimensional picture of what the Holy of Holies looks like. This is our best image of, of some of the stuff in there. You see the candelabra up there, which is the first, the first image uh, we have of a menorah. Uh, up on the right hand side, that's on the back side here. And then these wheels are chariots which represent um, the presence of God. And that's how um, people have come to understand um, that, that, that that's what this is. And then the question that we brought up, um, which is how did, how did Mary Magdalene become a prostitute? Um, you know, um, in America and Europe, we have these things called Mag Magdalene houses. Are anybody familiar with those things? Yeah. What are they? For fallen women, when they were rescued. Yeah, re recovered. We had, we had 300 of them. Um, the, anybody know the most famous person who was in a, it, it'll explain a lot of things when I tell you who this is, the most famous person who was a resident of a Magdalene house. I mean, there was a lot of 19th century literature on these Magdalene houses, like Charles Dickens liked to write about them and stuff. Um, Sinead O'Connor um, was at one, and so when you see her anger and hostility at the church, um, but it, they were for prostitutes who were um, being rescued and saved, and actually in Europe, they frequently uh, became laundromats, so they're called Madeline, Madeline Launders, um, and then the whole thing about the prostitute stuff left, and they're just laundries now. Um, but uh, yeah, that's so. How did we end up with this? It's not in the Bible anywhere that says that she was a prostitute. Um, where's this come from? And you can see medieval art is just full of this stuff where she's got red hair, she's lying about, she's always lying. I, you almost never see her walking unless she's falling over trying to grab Jesus, and he's telling her, Don't touch me, which is weird. In John, he's telling Mary not to touch him, and he's telling Thomas to touch him. But what's going on? Um, with that and and, um, and frequently you can have a lot of there's a lot of art that I couldn't show up here because um, it was showing you know what she used to come from but but the whole thing starts with Pope Gregory the, the Great in the year 591 in 591 he gave a sermon it's called a Paschal sermon he would give his Easter sermon and he took Mary and this anonymous woman who's called a sinner who takes an alabaster jar, breaks it open, puts it on Jesus' feet, and then uh, dries it with her with her uh, hair. And then Mary, the, the sister of Martha, um, who also anoints him with oil. And Greg takes, Gregory takes all three of those characters, merges them into one, mm -hmm. and he assumes that the fact that she's a sinner, that that means what? <laughs> you're a prostitute. It doesn't say in the Bible, it just says a sinner, but he's a dude. So he's thinking, uh, this, is what's, this is what's going on. Um, and he throws all of those things together. And the church held on to that for a long, 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 long time. 
um, throughout the Middle Ages, there, I mean, people loved painting this stuff. And it was only at the Reformation that some people started reading their Bibles when the, the, the Bibles became available to people, that people started noticing that this, these three characters were not actually one person. So in the 1500s, there start, it becomes actually a battle between scholars who are Reformation people who argue that she is not a prostitute and Catholic counter Reformation people who argue that, that Mary was a prostitute. <clears throat> This goes back and forth and back and forth, and finally, the, the, the Protestants end up winning the argument in the year 1969. Pope, uh, the, the Catholic Church officially acknowledged that it was wrong, and that uh, Mary Magdalene was not a prostitute, and was not one of these three things, that these were three separate individuals. And then in the year 2016, just recently, uh, Pope Francis um, declared July 22nd a major holiday for the Catholic Church. Um, so that's one of the two things. The other thing that she's known for, Mary Magdalene, in the church, she's known outside of the church in popular culture, there's many other things that we'll talk about that. But in the church, she's also known as the <coughs> apostle to the apostles. And this, this idea comes from what you were talking about. She's, um, and, and this, is, this is hard to read, but it's a schematic of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And there are a lot of contradictions between these things. They're hard to put together. Mark is written first, and then Matthew and Luke, they add a lot of stuff to it. And then John has his own take on everything, as he, as he always does. Um, but one thing that's true in all of these cases is um, Mary is with Jesus at the crucifixion. And in Mark, there are three people at the crucifixion. Um, there is... Um, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, um, uh, Salome, and Mary Magdalene. And as I told you, what, two interesting things. Mark, Mark plays down uh, the disciples and, and characterizes them as being generally not very smart and don't, <coughs> that they don't understand things. And the family members, he also emphasizes their, their, how they don't understand things at all either. But there's only one person in the Bible who's listed as the mother of James and, and Joseph. Joseph is J-O-S-E-S. -S. And that's um, Mary, the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus. So um, actually, uh, Matthew and Luke realize that he's talking about the Virgin Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus. So they actually say that's who's at the, I mean, at the crucifixion. They list her by name. And then Salome, we have no idea who Salome is before this reference. In, in this passage, um, except for, you know, later in church history, the, um, the tradition is that Jesus has two sisters, and that's the name of one of his sisters. Um, so it's possible, it's possible, it's not, not solid, it's not rock solid history or anything, but it's possible it's Mary Magdalene, Jesus' mother, and Jesus' sister, who's there watching, and they watch from afar, <laughs> which is a different scenario from John, they are way off in the distance in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in John, they're close enough that Jesus can talk to them. And, and Jesus says to the mother, his mother, here's your son and here's your mother, and she can hear and they can have all those things. But in these other passages, they're, they're far, far away. And, and as we talked about last time, it's a little bit disturbing that these things aren't always consistent with one another, but I tend to think the truth is in here somewhere. I, don't, I can't tell you exactly where it is, but it, it's in here somewhere. And that's been the tradition of the church to say, um, you know, we should take these things and let you have the whole thing and then try to work through it and figure it out and determine what's important and, and what's not. But the thing that's, that's important for us right here is um, she's there at the tomb, she's there at the burial, and she's there at the she's there after the resurrection. Nobody's there at the resurrection. That's the one thing. No one. The resurrection's never seen in the Bible. The only place the resurrection is witnessed or described is in the Gospel of Peter, one of these extra canonical Bible Gospels. Um, but um, a really weird Gospel. Um, How about jo Joanna? What's that? How about Joanna? What about Joanna? She was at one of the. Mention as being at the tomb. She's, one she's of them. It, but I'm saying the important thing for us in discussing Mary Magdalene, yeah, the, the figures who are there are different in each of one of these things. 
and I, I was emphasizing Mark because Mark's the first gospel written, and then the others are elaborating on it. But um, Joanne is there. But but uh, for our purposes, the important thing is Mary Magdalene is there at the crucifixion, at the burial. Mm -hmm. She witnesses the burial, and she's there after the resurrection, right? And this is the one with seven demons. The one with seven demons, right? And and and, and it's interesting if you're reading the Gospel of Matthew, you're just going along. And it says uh, the people at the people at the crucifixion include Mary Magdalene. You have no idea who she is. She just popped up out of nowhere. Um, but the uh, the author assumes you already know who she is, and the author of Mark assumes you already know who she is because she pops up in in um, in Mark uh, 15, and there are only 16 chapters, and she's at the very end. And there's no description of her, the one who had all of these things. And you got to remember these early gospels only went to like one community. If you were part of the Mark community, that was the gospel that you had. And that would be your understanding of what was going on. Like, so John, she, she's very important in that she's a witness to the resurrection. And in each of these cases, she's told to go, along with other women, to go tell the disciples uh, what had happened and that Jesus has been raised. Right? Mark is weird because <clears throat> they're told to do this. And what happens? Jesus may remember? It ends. They, 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 they get afraid and they leave and they never tell the disciples. So what's the point of that? <laughs> no, I think there's a point. I think there's a theological point the author's trying to make and that is it's incumbent on us to tell people about it. It's, it's not, it, it didn't happen then. So now Jesus and the, and the man in white, it doesn't even describe it as an angel. It says the man in white at the tomb um, tells them to do that. See, it's our responsibility to spread the word because it didn't happen then. And then, and then in um, Matthew and Luke, and Luke, they go back and they tell the disciples, and the disciples say, oh, this is just a bunch of hooey balooey. We don't believe it at all. Yeah. And then Peter has to go and confirm it, and then everybody's like, oh, okay, so this is real. Um, and, and, then, and then John, there's separate appearances between Martha, I mean, between Mary and, um, and Peter. So um, the one thing I didn't emphasize last week, you know, we have all these talk, these stories and stuff about how Jesus is married to Mary Magdalene, all this sort of stuff. Um, it is important that she's at these places because the duty that she's doing is really grimy, dirty, intimate work that she's doing, which is she's going to the tomb to take the naked body of Jesus and to provide oil and perfume and to wrap him up and prepare him for the next year. And what she's actually doing is in the first century, uh, they believed in the resurrection. Most of them didn't, did. The Sadducees didn't, but the Pharisees and all the Jesus followers did. They would wrap you up, you would uh, decompose, and they would come after a year, take your bones, put them in a bone box. And then at the resurrection, they believed it would all be reassembled and you would, you would be brought back to life. Um, so the work that she was planning to do is usually work that's only done by family members. Somebody's mother is someone who's going to do this sort of stuff. Not, not just some supporter or backer or whatever. To, to actually, first of all, picking up a, a guy, he wouldn't have been huge. You know, most estimates of men in, in this time would be that he was like 5'5", five, 5'6", five, five, 140. But still, that's, that's a big thing to pick him up, move him, clean him. He's just, he's just been beaten. He's got all these scars. I mean, not even scars. He's bloody and all that sort of stuff. I mean, this is very, very intimate work. It tells you that, that though all this stuff about the marriage might not be true, there's something about Jesus that was extremely intimate and important to her, right? You, you to... I was going to say that's probably the reason that the marriage rumors, you know, because she was so close. There, there's there's other explanations too, but I think, you know, just think about if we had to do the funeral work that people do for us today. I mean, that's nobody's going to. I mean, in the Jewish community today, you do have certain people who do that. And in fact, mm -hmm. I had a coworker at the Journal Sentinel, and that was his job. You frequently have to leave because in the Jewish community, you have to be buried in the first 24 hours after death. So they have to deal with it pretty quickly, but it's a specialist in the community today. But back then, it, it was a family member who had to take somebody who was 
beaten, scarred, bloody, and all of those things, and to sit down, it's going to take hours, and it's going to be entirely unpleasant. And so when they get there and the body's not there, it's incredibly confusing. But it says something about their relationship that they were that, sh that they were that she was there. I wonder how many examples of uh, in our own congregation. I know my mother cleaned my father up and dre and dressed him. Uh, so I'm sure that's not totally uncommon with, with wives. Or a big difference is he, he wasn't crucified. And, well, and yeah, crucified, yeah. a nasty, Dirty. brutal. Crazy. I mean, you, you got to remember, you know. People wear crosses today, and it's still, you know, sometimes it's sort of a funny thing to me because, you know, it's, it was propaganda to say, you got to pay attention to us. It's Pax Romana, peace under Rome, but it's peace under terror. And that is that, that you're going to, you're terrified and you don't want to disagree with them. And Jesus was saying, I'm king of the Jews. And they're like, you're the king of the nothings. We're going to wipe you out. And <coughs> um, so that, that's the important thing about all this. But even within, shortly after, and probably even in her lifetime, Paul is writing about who Jesus appeared to. And in this particular passage, he lists everybody that he can think of that Jesus appeared to. And he lists Cephas, who's Peter, that's his, his Greek name, the 12, which were the 12 people Jesus had appointed, actually be 11 at this point because um, Judas isn't around. Uh, 500 brothers and sisters at one time, so there's this mass appearance that seems to go on. Then he appeared to James, who we're going to talk to, uh, talk about in, J in June, his brother. He appears to his brother then, and, and that's very, very important. And then to all the apostles, and apostle and disciple are slightly different things there. I mean, it's changed over time. Apostle here means a messenger who, and most of the time it had to be someone who was baptized by John, followed Jesus, and, and spread the word about him. And then finally, to Paul. And who was missing from that list? Mary Magdalene and any of the other women. N none of the women who, <laughs> who had any of this stuff, is, they're all completely wiped out. So, um, so that's, that's an important thing about how the, the various characters who, in, in these other stories, she's the central figure. She's the one who's going to go tell the other apostles about this sort of stuff. But by Paul's time, and I don't think, some people think Paul is, is misogynistic and hates women and all this other stuff. And, you know, he does have issues with women. And some of the writings that are in his name but not by him are, are, are pretty rough and hard for us to listen to. But I think there are two traditions that are going on, and we can see it back here. In John, there are two parallel traditions. There's one where Jesus appears to Peter, and Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene, and um, people knew about one or people knew about the other, and I think, I think that uh, Paul, and he writes about it in Galatians, spent time with Peter and James uh, shortly after his conversion, and um, I think he knew all about Peter's story, but Mary Magdalene's story hadn't gotten, or he didn't know it for some reason. It's also possible he knew about it and, and just decided not to clue because the testimony of women was, as Luke tells us, tells us it was just not that relevant. People didn't trust it at that time. So go ahead. This, earlier, this is an earlier tradition than the Gospels. It is earlier than the Gospels. So this is this is written this around is this is written around the year 53, right. AD 53. The first Gospel, Mark, is written at 65, like 12 years later. So, so you've got competing traditions, competing stories, and that sort of stuff. But that's you know that's the great thing about the Bible. Instead of seeing it as one story that tells us the whole thing and blares it at us repeatedly, it's a library. With a bunch of with a bunch of stories, and and this is this is one story, and there's the other story. Yeah, if she goes to the tomb to care for the body, I, I'm thinking that it was possibly Jesus who exercised the demons, and she considered that he saved her life from a living hell, and she was grateful, and this is how she was going to show her gratitude by caring for his body. And it's been interesting over recent years to see doctors try to figure out what these different things are. What is leprosy? Because leprosy then isn't what leprosy is today. Demonic depression, uh, its possession then may not be what we think it is today. Some consider it uh, that a demonic uh, possession could be, um, could be schizophrenia or um, so something, you know, something where you have um, you know, a psychological disorder, and later Gregory the Great 
starts the tradition which grows and grows and grows and is still with us today, that it represents the seven deadly sins, the seven cardinal sins. And so she had each of those and then he's, he, uh, that's clear, but that idea doesn't really emerge until like five or 600 years after, after her death. So what happens to her after her death? A lot happens to her after her death because it's an interesting story and there are lots of holes in the story. <laughs> And people want to fill in those holes. And that's, this is the way Jewish literature works. The Old Testament is full of stories that they don't tell you lots of things. Uh, they tell you enough so that you have, can put it together, you can listen to it, and you can remember it. But they don't fill in a lot of things. Like I think I've told you repeatedly that uh, one important difference between contemporary literature and the literature in the Bible, and you could notice this any time we're doing a reading of the New Testament or even the Old Testament, um, novels today like to get inside your head and much of the novel is an explanation of what someone's thinking what their motives are what they might do in the Bible there's very very little discussion of what's going on ahead that the focus is on actions what they're doing what why they're doing this and if you're ever you know have to preach a sermon and you need to, to come up with a topic just fill in all those blanks and say what someone's thinking and uh, no one will know, no one will know, you know, that, that you're just creating it all. Um, because it is, I mean, it makes it interesting. What, I mean, there are, there are things, you know, when, when you have Jesus on the cross and John, he's completely in control of the situation. And he tells everybody what to do in the Garden of Gethsemane. They come to arrest him. They all collapse. He says, get up, guys. We've got to get on with this. And they arrest him and, and then moves on. And then he's on the cross and he says, it is finished. It's done, okay? This is, we're done with this. And John, it's my God, my God, you've forsaken me. What happened here? So what's going through his head when that's going on? I mean, it, you, can, you can do, you know, some sort of psychological analysis, but that stuff's just not in there. Um, so people start filling in what's going on about, go ahead. Is that, is that purposeful so that the, the oral storyteller can put things in on the fly or be creative? Or is that something an ancient person just never would have considered in storytelling? Um, uh, there's there's a, uh, a um, Jewish scholar named James Kugel, K-U-G-E-L, who's written a whole book on this. Um, it's called The Sense of Self and how the sense of self has changed over time. And then when we start thinking about ourselves, we don't think of ourselves the same way people in earlier periods thought of themselves. And actually, he argues that the fact that, that TV and movies and novels have helped internalize us more than we've ever been internalized before, that we can spend a lot of time thinking about what we're doing or why we're doing, and, and, and it moves us internal. It's, I, think there's some, I think there's probably some sense of that you're thinking about why you're doing things or um, a, a sense of guilt implies some sort of internal understanding of yourself. But shame is, is what's dominant in biblical times and that's a reflection of what the community thinks of you and you adopt what the community <coughs> thinks of you. So I, I think it's something that has immersed over time and you know it's a weird thing to think the way I think about myself is not the way people have always thought of themselves and how, how has that changed? But you, it, 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 since, since I read Kuhl's work when I watch a movie, you start th focusing on just how much time is spent on internal dialogue and what you're thinking about and people guessing what you're thinking about and all of those things. It, it, it just makes us obviously a more complex person. As a result, we also end up with, with illnesses that we didn't previously have um, because of um, disassociations between who we are internally and what we think we should be externally and, and all that. But I, th I think it also helps, um, it also helps, as you said, with storytelling, um, because in an oral culture, it's, it's easier to tell a story about, you know, what actually happened here, this person did this, this person did this, and to, to arrange the characters and you can build in, I mean, imagine trying to do internal dialogue in the Iliad. You've got hundreds of characters, you just can't do it. So, so it's a difficult thing to do. Yeah. Go ahead. For me, uh, there's a, a God message or a God wink where we need each other to know ourselves and to know the truth, the community, for the truth to emerge. 
two or three are gathered, I will be there. Midrash, the Jews get it. Yeah, which is, you know, Midrash is just basically filling in those gaps in the stories that we have. I love it, yeah. So, go ahead. Question. Are any, specifically Lazarus, of uh, Jesus raised from the dead, are they mentioned again? Like, for example, is Lazarus mentioned? Because you would think that he would be at the tomb. Yeah, La Lazarus, because Lazarus is not. But, um, but in the final week of Jesus' ministry, when he does the, um, when, when he does the cleansing of the temple and all of those things, which start, and, and I believe was what put him on Pilate's radar was the cleansing of the temple. Until that point, he was just another nobody from Galilee uh, to, to Pilate. But when he does that, he has a base of operation. Each night he goes somewhere, and that's he goes to the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Um, and so part of it gets confusing because in the New Testament, there are 16 women who are identified by name, and six of them are named Mary. Um, so it's sort of like the George Foreman problem, uh, where here's Mary and my sister Mary and my other sister Mary oh, sure. and my mother Mary, um, which in fact it does say Mary's, his mother had a sister named Mary. Um, and so they're all over the place uh, with him. So I'm gonna run, I'm gonna run through some of this stuff uh, right here and if, we'll probably touch on this in some class in the future if this is something you're interested in. Um, I've tried it before, but it's terribly interesting to me. Um, and that is when Christianity starts off, we've been taught um, basically because of a guy named Eusebius that the church was unified and went forward and there were occasional splinters and those are heresies and we cut them off and we kept on moving forward. But actually the way to think of it is it's like an atomic explosion. It just goes boom. It goes in many, many different directions. Um, and we have many different early Christianities, which is the term um, people in the early church refer to. There's the proto-Orthodox, who are the people who eventually <coughs> went out. And each of these groups have someone in the early church that they identify with very closely. And the early church identified with Peter. They also identify with Paul. But Peter's the rock. He's the guy that they base the church <coughs> on. Another group that we're going to talk about next month when we talk about James, and the brother of Jesus, are the Ebionites. The Ebionites means the poor, and I'll explain all that stuff to you next month. But they're basically Jewish Christians who continue to follow Jewish law, not the sacrifice, but everything else. Um, they don't believe that Jesus is um, the, uh, they, they believe he's the Messiah, but they don't believe that he's the third person, the second person in the Trinity. Um, and they think his, his sacrifice is the last sacrifice, and so there needs to be no other sacrifice after that. And that's what James taught and preached, and he and, he and Paul fought over this sort of hmm. thing. Do, Gal, do Gentiles who convert, do they need to be circumcised and all those things? Another group is the Gnostics, which we'll talk about for the next 10 or 15 minutes. And Mary Magdalene is someone who they attach to the, the Gnostics loved Mary Magdalene, and her history becomes a tied up and associated with the Gnostics. The Gnostics um, are a group of people who emphasize knowledge. Instead of the first group emphasizes faith. That's how you become saved. You stay loyal to the church early, and early on, and you believe in Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. The Gnostics believed it was knowledge, particularly internal knowledge. If you understand yourself, then you'll be able to get in touch with the divine spark within you, and um, you, you'll be able to achieve salvation. Flesh then, becomes dirty. What's that? Flesh becomes dirty, and that's the flesh. The flesh does. And and then finally, the Marcionites, who loved Paul, and in fact, they believed the earth was created by an evil god, and they threw out the entire Old Testament. Started with um, they started. They loved the god, and each of these had different gospels that they loved. They loved Luke and most of the letters of Paul. The, the Gnostics loved John. John was their favorite gospel. The Ebionites um, loved Matthew. Matthew is the most Jewish of all the gospels. And the Proto-Orthodox, I mean, they obviously eventually come to, to, to love all of them, but they, they, they also are uh, strong supporters of the gospel. John and poor old Mark, no one really liked him very much <laughs> until contemporary times when people realized, hey, this is actually the first gospel written. And Matthew and Luke actually had the Gospel of Mark in front of them when they're writing, 
And how does that affect what you're thinking about those Gospels when you realize those things? So what we know about Gnostics largely found as a result of this, this find in 1945 in a place called Nag Hammadi in Egypt. It's down here, here's Cairo, and the Nag Hammadi's down there. It's like a half dozen guys, Bedouin, Bedouin poor guys looking for fertilizer, go out chopping the ground trying to find fertilizer, and they hit um, something solid, and they pull out these great big uh, uh, bottles of, of stuff, and they can't tell what's in it. And they're afraid there might be a genie in it, so they won't open it. But they're also interested and think maybe there's gold in it, so they are interested. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they set it in the corner of their house for a year or so, and uh, eventually they open it, they smash them, and it's a bunch of books. So that, 13 wow. books. Probably more than 13 books, uh, because uh, that winter it got cold and the mother grabbed some of them and threw them in the fire. <laughs> and, and so we don't know what those were, they're gone. And the leader of the group, by the way, his name is Muhammad Ali. Um, and so, so it took from that year, 1945, to 1977 when they were first published, that people started learning about these texts. We've all heard about the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is almost equally important because what it tells us is another version of Christianity that existed early in the church, okay? And these are almost all Gnostic Gospels. Gospels <coughs> are later than the Gospels that we have, um, and they all tend to teach. They're very, very complicated and hard to understand. Um, and I'll give you a quick summary of what, what is Gnosticism. Um, and uh, he mentioned some of the key things there. And um, these, these are things that I just, I was trying to simplify it as much as possible. It is the world was created as a result of a cosmic mistake, not by the one true God. Hmm. Okay? So Yahweh is, uh, Yahweh might have created things, but Yahweh is not the one true God. Okay? He, he's, he might be a, um, he, he's probably the son of Sophia, who's wisdom, who's the, the daughter of the one true God. And Yahweh got drunk on a weekend and created the earth. <coughs> <laughs> the material world alienates us from our true lives as spiritual beings. As Christians, we're taught God created the world and it was <clears throat> they believe uh, Yahweh created the world and it was bad. And so everything that we can touch, feel, or any of that sort of stuff drives us away from what is important. The goal of Gnostic religions is to help us transcend the, the material world and return to our heavenly home. The belief was that, um, that there's a spark of the divine within us, and we need to find that and recover it, and that'll help us get to heaven. And the salvation comes through knowledge, not faith. And it's not just like learning book knowledge, it's self-knowledge, and it's this elaborate cosmologies of how the world is, is that there's certain levels, some some of them have four levels to heaven, others have 12 levels of heaven. They have many levels and you have to figure out a way to get through all those things to get all the way back up to God. And then finally, Christ provides the special knowledge and gnosis means knowledge. Um, so that's where this idea comes from. Go ahead. So Gnosticism, if, if I'm correct here, they had a belief of body not or mind, not body, and they separated both and therefore they would they, they could sexually be active and, and promiscuous and everything else. Well, actually, actually it, it drove them in two different directions. There are Gnostic groups that were promiscuous and thought that what you did with your body was not important. And then there were others exactly. that believed that, that uh, your body was unimportant and so you should not do anything with it. And that you should, if you're engaging the flesh and doing those things, that that's bad and you should be ascetic. And, and you should not be engaged in any sort of sexual activity. So it's weird. It's not like one religion. It's a whole group of different people with these ideas that what they're basically doing is taking ideas that were around because of Plato and they're merging ideas from Plato with ideas about Christianity. And, and the language is really weird. Um, I'm going to take the Gospel of Thomas, which is the best known of all of these things. And I'm going to, I'm going to read you, this is, there are two references to Mary in it. And this is the first one. And if you understand it, tell me what it means, okay? <laughs> Mary said to Jesus, what do, you, what do your disciples resemble? Or what are they like? What are your, how do we know who your disciples are? And Jesus said, 
What they resemble is children living in a plot of land that is not theirs. When the owners of land come, they will say, surrender our land to us. They, for their part, strip naked in their presence in order to give it back to them, and they give them their land. Oh. Amen. Um, <laughs> read that on, on Sunday morning. Um, I, I think I understand what it means. It means the earth is like that land, um, and it's evil and bad, and that we're here, and we're living here, and that we're not the owners of this land. This land is owned by someone else, and they're since evil forces, and when those evil forces take over, we're supposed to abandon and get away. And the strip naked part, probably a reference to baptism. Yeah, our um, bodies are evil. And, and, and so, well, so there's a separation between the world and who we are, and, and all of these things. So, did yeah. our mainline church ostracize and? and, and so it's a, it's a, it's like a 300 to 400 year process where the funny thing is, as I told you, what we've been taught is that there's one stream and there are these little offshoots, but actually it goes in many, many different directions. And finally, the group that I called proto-Orthodox went out. They, they're able to defeat the Ebionites, the Gnostics, and the Marcionites. And what's interesting in the, fourth, in the fourth century, around the year 350, is that in 360, 365, um, a bishop um, makes the first list of 27 books that's in the New Testament. We think the New Testament is around, but from the time Jesus died until 367, um, th there's not one agreed upon list of what's in the New Testament. People had different ideas about what belonged. And around the year 350, a group of monks thought, we're gonna get in trouble. We've got all these documents that aren't okay, so they bury them in the ground. And they stay there until the year 1945. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a version, you know, we always say that uh, the winners are the ones who write history and so forth, and that's generally true. It's not true for the Old Testament, because the Jews lose again and again and again and again, but they still survive. It's, it's more history is by the survivors, not by the winners. And, and in this case, the, the proto-Orthodox are the ones who went out. But there are, we have traces of each of these other groups. So this is the Gnosticism that I'm talking about. Um, and Mary appears twice in Thomas, which is the most popular. And a lot of people have pushed Thomas because they think it's, it's hip and it has some interesting things to say. The interesting thing about Thomas is it's 114 sayings. There's no birth story, there's no death story. It's just Jesus and his disciples talking. And that's what most of these are. Their focus is on knowledge, not on the death, burial, and resurrection of so we have this one verse, and then we have this really, really weird verse, which is the end of it all. And that is, Simon Peter said to them, let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. <clears throat> Jesus said, I myself shall leave her in order to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman, every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of, God, of heaven. Thanks be to God. That's like half a statement there. So based no, no, on it's, 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 an entire, it's an entire statement, but right. But, but one, based on the Gnostic Gospels, and if you've read them, like the Gospel of Mary, the second sentence there would be for every um, man who will make himself female will enter the kingdom of heaven. It's about a non-binary identification and a consciousness and or identity with the soul, not with the role of male or female. It's also a first an understanding of how humans relate to each other. Right. We think of humans as a spectrum, across a spectrum, female to male, male to female, and, and across those things. Um, what Jesus is talking, and, and this isn't something Jesus said, um, it, this comes from like the second century, but theirs was horizontal. And at the bottom would be animals, slaves, children, women, men. And that to achieve salvation, you have to move up the ranks until you become male, and male ends up being closer to what is, what is um, the, ideal, uh, the ideal figure. You'll see this a lot, starting with Aristotle, that women are incomplete men. Um, uh, and this notion carries on and on and on and on. But this is just, this is just um, I mean, it's, it's funny because the Gospel of Thomas has been promoted as, as a very um, popular 
um, thing, but then you run into this at the end, and most of us don't have any understanding of what it means. And as Sue was saying, there's, there's this belief that salvation eventually, and I'm going to get to another passage that talks exactly about that, that, um, that salvation goes beyond gender. Mm. And, and Mary Magdalene in these Gospels, this is, this is what she becomes. One, she's a close companion of Jesus throughout all of these things. Two, she holds some sort of special knowledge that other, gos other disciples do not have. Three, she's opposed by certain male disciples. Not all of them, but certain ones, and you have to watch who the ones are that oppose her. And then finally, she teaches the need for an inner transformation, a transformation that comes from learning about yourself internally, not through the church. That's how salvation comes in these teachings. And this is how Mary Magdalene shifts from the character that she was in the past and, and until she is in the Gnostic Gospels. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you, instead of telling you about each of these different books, I'm going to give you two things to look at, two trends that occur. I'm not going to run through the cosmologies and all of the ideas, but I want you to look at what Jesus has to say about Mary in some of these things. One, Mary said, so the wickedness of each day is sufficient. Workers deserve their food. Disciples resemble their teachers. She so spoke this utterance as a woman who understood everything. She's actually teaching the other apostles in this, in this passage. And she's saying stuff that actually in the, our Bible are things that Jesus said. And it seems to be in the dialogues of the Savior that Jesus is actually learning from her. Um, so she's got this incredibly superior role. Here's, here's another one in this uh, odd, really bizarre book called Pistis Sophia. And if you sat down and tried to read this, you, you, would, you wouldn't make it past by the second page. But, um, but it's interesting. When Mary finished saying these things, um, she's interpreting this, god, this goddess, Pistis Sophia. Pistis means faith. Sophia means wisdom. When she finished saying these things, Jesus said, Well done, Mary. You are more blessed than all the women on earth because you will be the fullness of the fullness and the completion of the completions. So that idea about... Well, I told you about genders. You're moving toward a complete whole person. It's not just it's not just male and female that that you're dealing with here. Who's saying this? Uh, this is Jesus. Je Jesus says this is the text. The text says Mary is talking, and Mary says these things. She interprets what God is saying, and then Jesus says to her, "You are more blessed than all the women on earth." Is this wisdom literature? What is it? Yeah, this is Gnostic literature. This is uh, the Pista Sophia was found at Nag Hammadi. Um, and the Gospel of Philip, the next one I'm going to quote to you, also comes from Nag Hammadi. And these are just texts from the second, third, and fourth century after she's dead. And these are texts that people are writing about and, and so forth. But what I'm trying to show you is in this literature, she becomes highly elevated in Jesus' view and within the community. May I say something? It's going on today. The Texas legislature has just ruled a committee to bury Kazantzakis last temptations and to get rid of right. the Da Vinci Code and put it in the ground. <laughs> and, and, instead of actually learning from these things, what do these exactly. things tell you, it's like the sociologist? So this is the Gospel of Philip, one of the most critical ones, and one if you've read the Da Vinci Code, you'll be very familiar with, okay? Um, there were three that always walked with the Lord, and this is the author of the Gospel of Philip, found in the, in the um, in Nagamati, Mary, his mother, and her sister, and Magdalene, the one who was called his companion. His sister and his mother and his companion were each called, were each a Mary. So that's where we have Mary and then Mary and then another Mary. Um, and in the, in the Da Vinci Code, they tell you, well, actually, the Aramaic for companion means spouse. And so this is the proof that they're married. But unfortunately, it's not in Aramaic. Um, it's a Coptic, <laughs> and companion means companion. It means like an associate, someone who's a follower. And these texts are really beaten up because they were, they were at Muhammad Ali's place for a long time. And so this is, this is another text that's become pretty popular. <clears throat> and where I have brackets and dot, 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 that's a hole in the text. <laughs> and the companion of the dot, 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 Mary Magdalene, dot, 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 her more than dot 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 the disciples kiss her dot 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 on her dot 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 <laughs> and the rest of the disciples dot 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 they said to him why do you love her more than all of us um so you can fill that in any way you want to <laughs> 
<laughs> the one thing is almost everybody's agreed on one thing that this dot 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 I mean this dot 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 is mouth that he would kiss her on her mouth but earlier in the text it explains what this is that Jesus kisses and passes <coughs> his wisdom on to people through this and in the early church there was a instead of doing the handshake that we do now or whatever our high five uh, when passing the peace um, they used to kiss it's something that's even mentioned in the Bible so it's not seen as a necessarily a sexual thing but if you come at it with our hypersexualized look at things and you think companion means spouse and this means on the mouth then you pretty much got yourself a novel um, <laughs> But because of the significance of the breath, it's a sharing of knowledge through the breath. It's not a sexual yeah. implication at all. Right. It's it's it, it's yeah. It's not it's not a sexual thing. But it's it's a um, and this is just this is one of the best pages of the gospel. So, mm -hmm. in case you're wondering. So, yeah. so this is um, this is an example of the sort of tension that went on at this time, and it's reflected in the text. Peter stepped forward and said to Jesus, this is in the Epistle of Sophia, my master, we cannot endure this woman who gets in our way and does not let any of us speak, but she talks all of the time. Uh-oh. Then she talks, then she talks, and she says, I understand in my mind that I can come forward at any time to interpret what Epistle of Sophia has said. So she feels comfortable in the group with Jesus there to interpret what God is saying to everybody else. But I'm afraid of Peter because he threatens me and hates our gender. Wow. So who is it she's fighting with? Peter. 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 And Peter represents what to all of these people? Proto-Orthodox. The Proto-Orthodox, the church, the establishment. She represents the opposite of that. A place where women were in leadership in many of these places, whereas on the other side, the men were in leadership oh, in all these places. Go ahead. What language was that? Uh, this is this is in Coptic, but it's in two different languages. It's in Greek too. Um, so, um, so uh, yeah, the Pistis and Sophia. You should get the Sophias from the from the Greek ideas, and that's that's the influence of all these things. Tend to go back to the Greek because of Plato's influence on, on these things. Um, which all brings us to the Gospel of Mary, um, which is a very important gospel, found in 1896, but didn't get published until 1955, because it got kicked around a whole bunch of times. And the guy who was translating it never got it done. Well, he did, and then this World War I broke out, and then World War II, and it didn't really come here, and didn't become popular until um, Elaine Pagels, a, a historian at, at Princeton, and, and Karen King, a historian at Harvard uh, really started to publicize it and let people know about it. This is what the book, this is one book. There are lots of translations. Karen King's is probably my favorite, but Marvin Meyer's a good translation too. This is what the text looks like. And then more than half of the text is gone. The first six chapters is gone. But I'll give you a quick summary of what's in it. Um, it's at the very end. Jesus is leaving his disciples with some words of wisdom before ascending to heaven. For instance, he says to the, to the people, when someone says something about the Son of Man, it says he's there, or, or he's there. Ignore them. The Son of Man is within you, and you will get your salvation from within. Okay? Um, he also says, um, his very last thing that he tells them is, do not add any laws to what I've given you. Um, just follow those laws, and anything that you do beyond that is, is not relevant or important. After Jesus leaves, the disciples become afraid. They're like, if they executed him, what are they going to do to us? And um, Mary Magdalene reassures them that Jesus has made them truly human. That through him, you've risen above being just a male or a female. We are now fully human, and we've been prepared to this task. Peter then asks Mary to explain some of her secret teachings that Jesus has shared with her. And she does. She tells these elaborate stories about traveling through the four heavens, and how salvation will come as a result of that. I would explain it to you, but none of you would understand it. And, <laughs> and I would be making up like half of it. So, um. Hold on, but that's not entirely true. I think you would understand. Mary's gospel is based on her ascension from the seven deadly sins that Jesus, ascension of her soul, from the seven deadly sins that Jesus or whoever cleansed her from. So it really is directly related to overcoming 
um, the war or the internal conflict between the soul and the lusts of the passion, which you kind of alluded to, Dan, uh, and that's what her whole gospel, a large part of her gospel, is about. And I think you would get it. It's not that so, hard. So it, it, it is, you just have to spend some time. It would be like if you knew nothing about Christianity and you picked up the letters of Paul and started reading it and you would run into faith and repentance and all this stuff. They're terms that mean a lot to us because we grew up with them. These terms mean a lot of things to the people who were Gnostic because they grew up with them and they understood these concepts. But, but it does take a little, Kerry King's work is probably the best at giving you a background on, on some of these things. And then, and, and then Andrew jumps in and says that her ideas are strange and that they make no sense. And then Peter said, um, why are we even listening to her? Um, did, did Jesus prefer her to us? Did he prefer the guys to us? And then Andrew, uh, I mean Levi, who is Matthew, then concludes the whole thing by jumping in and saying, if the Savior made her worthy, who are you to reject her? Surely the Savior knows her well. That is why he has loved her more than us. Um, and, and so it comes back around so that Mary's not the author of this text. It's a story of, of um, this discussion between Jesus and um and um, Mary and the other people, and then after they leave, the discussion between the various disciples. Um, so, do you want to talk? Just do you mind talking a little bit more? I know we don't have a whole lot of time. Yeah, and we could really do a whole class on the whole that what you talked about with Gnosticism, because I think you prevented or um, provided like a black and white uh, kind of extreme presentation of it, and the Gospel of Mary and some of these other. Um, non-canonical gospels are really about inner transformation not necessarily that the body is bad and that the flesh is bad but that the god spark like dan talked about or the place to encounter christ inside that that's part of the education of those gospels i don't think they're necessarily saying one thing over another but they're trying to enlighten and educate in a way that jesus intended for you to be so connected to the Christ inside that you were able to live in that kind of consciousness um, without the need for the sacrifice or the atonement, um, without the need for the ethical or moral prescriptions of the church, which the men, we know, men developed and made that a permanent thing. And the Gospel of Mary and other literature that is being talked about now is just asking, what would the church look like if it came from that place of love? What would the church look like if we were all enlightened and fully aware of the presence of Christ within us and coming from that place in our words, in our actions, and in our intentions? So there's really quite a bit more there um, than meets the eye, I think. And it's really interesting. But do you think reading. we should do a whole class on Gnosticism? Well, it would depend on if you would give me the time yeah. <laughs> that I was <laughs> promised that they give you this class. I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that. Because uh, there's a lot that, the, there were a lot of passages stuff. too that hmm. you mentioned that um, I could have added a little information about the perspective coming from the Gnostic perspective, and um, lots of comparisons of you know how it's written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then how it's written or where it's also found in some of these other texts. So, and you've probably done something similar to that like years ago, but I do think no, it's no, interesting. Could, I mean, we could do it again. I mean, if people are interested in this, is this something interesting yeah. to you or not? Yeah. 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 Um, the, I mean, she's saying that's what it is. So this is actually something that's over the last like 25 years has started, started to emerge and it's become very important in um, feminist circles. Um, it, it's not, um, there's, Historians have not really opened up to it much, and as you know, my approach is generally historical with this stuff. So, um, so when I was talking about, when I'll say, uh, there are different ways to read these texts. Um, I don't think Jesus actually, personally, I don't think Jesus said any of this stuff that's in these most synoptic gospels. Most of them, some of them are three or 400 years after the fact, um, but there are ways to read them that are consistent with what's in the Bible. And sometimes there are ways that, that they they highlight and provide insight into what is in the Bible. Um, go ahead. Well, I, I'm confused though. We're talking about a bunch of stuff that's not in our Bible. This is and what how happens much is, we put reference. So what happens is we end up with four gospels. There are about 35 to 40 gospels. And gospel doesn't always mean the same thing. 
the gospel doesn't always mean a biography or whatever. As I told you with Thomas, Thomas frequently is, uh, I mean, it's 114 things. And it's usually Jesus saying something to something other, somebody else. Other times, when they were going through these non commodity texts, if it was something that, that um, had a discussion about who Jesus was, they would tend to give it the title gospel. But there are also uh, acts in addition to what's in the gospel. There's revelations in addition to the revelations that are in the Bible. Um, and there are other letters that go on. And then there are, um, there are, there are a lot of them that are, um, I mean, I, a couple of weeks ago, I was just trying to read through um, the, the, um, the testimony of our Savior. And it, it is, I mean, it's not, it, it, there's no mention of Mary Magdalene, there's no mention of anything else except for Jesus. And you end up getting caught up into which, which cosmology existed at that particular time. Um, and and you know Plato's followers developed these incredibly elaborate cosmologies of what happened behind the scenes because what was important to them was what was behind the scenes, not what's here and now in front of us. And and yeah, th there's the whole story of the cave that what we see is just what's on the cave. Um, so so we'll come back again and revisit this next year, um, next session in some greater detail. Um, focusing on, we'll focus on what this has come to mean in contemporary, in contemporary discussions about, um, about Mary Magdalene. Um, but it is, I mean, my main point is, so there's this small story about her that exists and her central importance, which is suppressed, and there's not much discussion about who she is, and even then, Paul suppresses it even more. It's only after after her death that we end up having the Gnostics who take her ideas, actually we don't even know if they're her ideas, who take her as a symbol for Gnostic ideas and inner transformation. And, and that becomes an alternative to Christianity. But in fact, what Sue was saying is true, but it was actually seen as a huge threat. And you can see the Gnostic Gospels, not the Gnostic Gospels, but Gnostic ideas talked down in the epistles and people, it, it, it's interesting, at the time of the early church, everybody thought they were the Christians. They all thought they were right. And so each of them are calling the other ones heresies. So you can find the proto-Orthodox calling the Ebionites heretics. You can find the proto-Orthodox, I mean, the, the, the Ebionites who hated Paul, calling Paul a heretic and saying, uh, actually, it's interesting, and, and we, don't, we don't usually use this verse very much, but in Galatians, Jesus is, uh, Paul is very upset with the group that eventually becomes the Ebionites because they want to circumcise everybody. And he said uh, in, in Galatians 5, um, may they accidentally uh, cut themselves uh, in a particular place uh, if they uh, change the gospel that I'm telling you. Um, so it gets pretty brutal in the talks. And the, the people who take the Nag Hammadi texts and bury them, they're serious. They are afraid for their lives because in the starting... Christianity starts to become affirmed as the official religion, and those who hold views that are not okay, or not in line with the proto-Orthodox, are starting to get executed. So today, we can look at these things and say, this is interesting, this is helpful for us for inner transformation. But at that time, the monks who are there reading this sort of stuff as scripture realize we're in deep trouble, we need to get rid of these documents. And, and it's only because of uh, the discovery, which is complete happenstance that we know about most of these documents. But so, I just, and I just want to say they represented, the people who went and hit that stuff, They re the desert fathers and mothers, they represented the contemplative arm of Christianity, which basically was subdued, suppressed, and buried. Mm -hmm. And that's all looking at this literature is about for me, is it's like, what, what are we missing in our faith journey that would allow us to draw closer to God? Because some people have that desire. I want this deep quest to have an internal relationship with God. And I can read, and Chuck, I get what you're saying about the Gospels. I can read that, and it's all going to make sense up here in my head, but in my heart, what's the way that I'm going to get as close to God as possible? And that's what I think that tradition was about, and it has been almost extinguished until, like in the 60s, they started coming up with, it was 1977 when the Center Lady prayer. The, gospel, mm -hmm. the Nazi gospel yeah. on the National Book Award. That people started realizing what these things were. Right. Um, and that they have a place in our faith tradition, and they're not a threat. They're a compliment. 
And 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 uh, when we revisit this next next time, we can also talk a little bit about the gospel of Jesus's wife, which turned out not to be a gospel. At all. Um, yeah, and if you don't follow the church, it cost six hundred thousand Cathars and Huguenots their lives in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's true, and actually, they 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 were strong believers in Mary Magdalene. Um, but they had some they had some weird beliefs. Yeah, <laughs> and they do go. You know, that's that's. It's gotta get the last word in. Oh, uh, I the the, I mean, there, there are the, the the problem from the church's perspective is what control. Mm -hmm. You can't control a lot of this when you go in a bunch of different directions. Right. Um, and you know, there there's there's there are different groups that I haven't even mentioned that go off in very, very different directions that aren't even in the direction that, that Sue was talking about. Um, a, a group called the Fibionites and other groups that end up moving way far afield on uh, their beliefs about Mary Magdalene. And the church would say, see, look what happens when you don't follow the church. Uh, this, this is what's going to occur. So um, next month, then, we're going to take on, we're gonna take on um, James, what James had to say, and um, as I said, faith is the important thing that's important to the um, proto-Orthodox. Knowledge is what's important to the Gnostics. The Ebionites and the followers of James, it's actions. It's what you do that's important. Helping others, doing things that are acts of charity. That's what they thought was the important thing. And uh, they end up being crushed uh, in, in the early churches, early years of the church as well. So we'll do that next time. Thank you.